That way I'll be sure I'm heard real well. My voice is getting a little weaker as I've gotten older. And that's one of those things that you just have to take in your stride if you live long enough. I think that's true at least. It seems to be with me. My singing voice just isn't there like it used to be. And I do love to sing. I've enjoyed so very much the beautiful singing tonight that I've got to listen to and kind of halfway join in. I enjoyed this morning tremendously. There's nothing I love, nothing I delight in more than teaching a Bible class. And we had such a marvelous group this morning for the class. Uh, preaching would come second. I like to do that too. Since I've given my life to the work of the Lord, I enjoy greatly uh, being able to present some lessons that I trust may be of value to some people. Appreciate getting to see many old friends and making some new acquaintances uh, here at Piper Street. I love very dearly the church here. Uh, I'm so thankful for its firm stand for the truth and for its determination not to be drawn away into the liberalism and modernism and humanism that is so rampant uh, in our brotherhood today. So it delights me that I was able to come, invited to come, and so I appreciate the invitation. Thankful for being here. Good to have each one of you. Thought tonight we might talk a while, uh, among other things, about uh, the rich young ruler and the lawyer who came to Jesus and asked him a question, uh, what shall I do that I may eat, uh, have eternal life? The rich young man said, Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, beginning. That same uh, story is told in Mark chapter 10 and verse 17, beginning, and also in Luke chapter 18 and verse 18, beginning. In other words, all three of those passages deal with the rich young ruler, and compi combined, they tell us something about him. In Matthew 16 and uh, 19 and 16, it begins with, Now, this young man came and fell down before Jesus and said, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? You remember Jesus asking, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one God. Uh, I'd like to emphasize the fact that in most of the later versions, uh, in Matthew, that account is changed to read that the young man came to Jesus and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus' answer is changed to, uh, Why do you ask me about what is good? Now, both those aren't true. Uh, those versions that have the letter, that is, uh, what, uh, good te uh, Teacher, what good thing shall I do? Uh, have the, it right in the other two passages, in Mark 10 in Luke 18. But in Matthew, they changed it because of a couple of Greek manuscripts that uh, they'd be Greek to you, I'm sure. But uh, two young scholars by the name of Westcott and Hort, back before the English uh, Revised Version came out in 1881, uh, did a lot of research, their main effort being to disprove the validity of the Greek text used by the King James translators. And they found a manuscript down in the Vatican that they dubbed the Vaticanus, and it was given in the catalog as B, uh, the designation for that particular manuscript. And it has uh, the change in Matthew chapter 19 and uh, verse 16 beginning, and it has a lot of other changes. In other words, when you read Matthew in some of the later versions, the influence of that, that version, the Vaticanus, also the one Tischendorf found down at uh, Sinai. There's a monastery built down there that's supposed to be on the Mount of God, uh, in the place or near the place where the burning bush was, near the place where the law was given by God to the Israelites. And he found uh, a manuscript that he just fell in love with. And he got some pages of it and went back and got some more, got most of it finally. So it's uh, styled as being the Olaf. Uh, Tischendorf didn't want to designate it by number less than that was available. In other words, A had been taken, B had been taken, C had been taken, D had been taken. So he went to the Hebrew alphabet, Olaf, the first letter, and uh, styled his uh, work uh, after that. And it's usually referred to as the Olaf uh, trans uh, translation, uh, manuscript rather. And those two leave uh, the changes in Matthew. They also are responsible for having the last 
verses of Mark 16 uh, deleted from the text. Most of the later versions will have bracketed uh, expressions from verse 1 uh, through verse 20 of Mark 16, saying that they are doubtful. Uh, as, the, as the NIV says, the uh, better manuscripts omit. You know, they're not really better, but uh, according to their estimation, they were. But I thought it might be of value to you, or some at least in passing, to think about why there is some differences. But our lesson mainly has to do with what this young man asked Jesus and his reply uh, to the young man. For when uh, the young man said, uh, What uh, good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? The Lord's uh, answer was, Essentially, keep the law. Do what God said to do. It's that simple. It was that simple then. It's that simple now. Uh, In all three passages dealing with the rich young ruler... We have that same answer. Uh, The young man said, well, which? As though there might be one that would be so important that he might keep it, you see, and be certain that he'd go to heaven, that he'd have eternal life. And the Lord uh, named some of the Ten Commandments. Basically, those that had to do with relationship of one person to another. He didn't mention the first, second, third uh, 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 commands of the Ten Commandments. Uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any make unto thee any graven images to fall down and worship them. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Didn't deal with that area of the Ten Commandment law, but simply that latter part that had to do with our relationship to others. And his answer was, I've done all these from my youth. What lack I yet? And you'll recall that Jesus told him that if you'll be perfect, if you'll be complete, if you'll be a finished product, then uh, sell what you have, give to the poor, and come follow me, you'll have treasure in heaven. And the young man went away full of sorrow because he had great possessions. He had a lot of wealth. Uh, His wealth got in his way. And, of course, Jesus knew what his trouble was when he told him what he would need to do. There's no doubt. But you and I can take a lesson from that, even though that was done under the Old Testament dispensation, under the time when the law was still in force. That Jesus said, now you keep the law, and that's what you have to do. In Mark uh, chapter 10 and verse 25 beginning, we have a lawyer asking Jesus, what is the great commandment? Now, he didn't ask him what to do to be saved or what to do to, do to have eternal life, but the thought is basically the same. Now, what is the great commandment? And the Lord uh, told him, well, he, first of all, he asked him, uh, what uh, saith the law? How readest thou? In other words, what does God say in the law about what the commandment is? And this lawyer answered, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus said, Thou shalt well say it. You've answered right. Uh, this do and you shall live. In other words, eternal life will be you, yours if you keep the law of God. If you do what God said to do. And basically, that's true in this dispensation as well. Though the law is different, the Old Testament law was uh, taken out of the way. It was abolished. It was nailed to the cross. And we're no longer under that law, as we read in Ephesians 2.15 and Colossians 2.14, that the law is no longer binding on us. It was a middle wall of partition that stood between the Jews and the Gentiles in removing the law. And now we have a law that's the law of Christ. Uh, Paul mentions it in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you may remember. Down about verse 21, I believe, uh, that he says, uh, talking, I might become all things to all people, you know, that I might gain some. And uh, to those without uh, the law as without the law, not being without law, in a parenthetical statement now, but under God's law, the law of Christ. In other words, Christ's law was that under which Paul was serving and we find it mentioned in different places in Galatians 3, uh, 6 rather, in verse 2, I believe, or 3, where he's talking about uh, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. James calls it in James 1.25 the perfect law of liberty. But back to the matter of the lawyer who asked Jesus, now what is that great commandment? Uh, and back to the young ruler who asked uh, what good thing shall I do that I may tr- uh, uh, gain eternal life? 
Back then, it was a matter of keeping the law of Moses because it was still binding. And in Matthew 22, verses 37 and 38, we find Jesus telling what the law is. Then he says that on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, they're basic to everything that God has commanded. That you're to love God supremely. You're to love God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, the Matthew account gives. In that in Luke, we have uh, also the matter of your strength. Everything that you have, everything you're capable of doing or being, is to be devoted to God in love. And when we love God like that, we're going to do what God says to do. Uh, I like that very much. As John points out in 1 John 5 and verse 3, you may remember, where he says, This is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. Uh, this is love now. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments. Uh, when we think about keeping commandments, we don't think of love ordinarily, do we? And yet it's so associated with love that uh, it's equal to, it's a product of, it's a fruit of that love when we do what the Lord said to do. And when we fail to do what God says to do, it simply means that we don't really love God that much. In our religious world today, we have division that is rampant. We have uh, division on every hand. And yet most of the people who are religious would say, or sing with us, Oh, how I love Jesus, you know. Uh, they'd just say they're, they're just so in love with the Lord. And yet Jesus stated in John 14 and verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. In other words, it's a proof of the love, the keeping of the commandments are. And many people today are determined that they do love the Lord, and yet uh, they seem to be unaware of the fact that they're not keeping the commandments or doing the things that the Lord would have them do. It's sad indeed. I think probably the saddest passage in the entire New Testament is found in Matthew 7 and verses tw 21 through 23. There Jesus said, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name? In thy name cast out demons. In thy name do many wonder works. And Jesus says that he'll have to say to them, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Here are people who thought they were serving the Lord. They apparently thought in good conscience and sincere faith that they were doing what the Lord said to do, and yet they were not doing what the Lord wanted done. They had not entered Christ. They had not become His disciples. They had not put Christ on. But they had lived in a religious fashion that had kept them separated from the Lord. We have many doctrines in our land today that would do that. I think you understand Probably that of faith only for salvation would be the most popularly held and the most firmly believed and the most tightly uh, and determinedly held as being God's command. Uh, you mentioned that it's not by faith only to some, and those are fighting words, you know. Uh, those of us who believe that you have to do more than just believe are looked down upon by some of their ministers, some of their preachers, as being people who believe in water salvation. Because we believe that when Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, that we really believe that. We believe that it takes both elements, that you have to believe and you have to be baptized. And there's so many passages in the Bible that we can bring up to show, well, it is that way. There's no question about it. But there are other passages in the Bible that seem to indicate that, well, is it really that way, you know? I want to deal with that just a little bit more in a moment, but I'd like to go back to this question, what must I do to be saved? As asked on Pentecost Day, Acts chapter 2. In verse 37, after Peter had preached that great sermon about Jesus and Him crucified, not left in the grave, not left in the Hadean world, raised and made both Lord and Christ, the people were pricked in their heart and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They wanted to get out from under the sin that they were under for having rejected Christ and having caused Him to be crucified. Peter's answer was from heaven. Peter, the inspired apostle, gave the answer. And you and I recognize that. And yet it's ignored so completely by so many religious people today. 
Peter said, Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. This is what you have to do in order to be saved. I was in the hospital over at Memphis one time some years ago, and there was an elderly gentleman, oh, about as old as I am now, but back then he seemed pretty elderly, you know. Uh, he uh, had had an accident in the car accident, and he was all uh, stove up and couldn't move around. And I waited on him quite a bit. And we talked about the Bible. And uh, when discussing it, I asked him, I said, Do you know what Acts 2.38 says when Peter was asked, uh, uh, What shall we do by those people who had heard the sermon? And in a kind of a weak voice, he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he'd been preaching for years and years and years in a denomination that preaches faith only. I said, no, no, no. Uh, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. He didn't use that passage. He never used that passage. He wasn't familiar with it. He thought it was uh, Acts 16 and verse 30, you know. Uh, when uh, the Philippian jailer had uh, been, well, do you remember how the earthquake happened and uh, the bonds of Paul and Silas were loose? The, all the doors were open. The jailer woke up and saw that this had happened, and he was afraid all of them had escaped. Uh, took his sword and was about to take his own life, apparently. And Paul and Silas cried out, Do thyself no harm, we're all here. And he came in, trembling, called for a light, fell down before them, said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Now that's the nearest you're going to come to faith only. But if you go ahead and read the next verses, you find that they did that which produces faith. They preached to him and his family. They presented the word to them. And then they were baptized the same hour of the night, straightway. And uh, then they set food before Paul and Silas, ministered to them, rejoicing, believed uh, in the Lord. But we find the same question asked by Paul in Acts chapter 9. You remember when Paul, uh, Saul then, Saul of Tarsus, heading for Damascus with letters of authority to bind Christian men and women and bring them back to Jerusalem uh, to punish them because they were Christians. And Jesus appeared to him on the road, you remember? And it was a light so bright that his, he lost his sight. Uh, he was led into the city. But before he was led into the city, uh, Jesus uh, asked him, Why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Uh, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks, against the gold. And uh, Saul immediately said, now this indicates the immediate faith, the immediate and openness of Paul as far as his belief leading to a desire to obey. Lord, what will you have me do? I like that. That shows the kind of person he was. That shows why Jesus had said later uh, to the preacher Ananias when he sent him to see about Paul, restore his sight to him, and uh, to lay his hands on him, remember, and tell him what to do. Uh, we find uh, this preacher saying to Paul, well, we don't have it in Acts chapter 9. We find that he was baptized, uh, that he began to preach Jesus, that later he went back down to Jerusalem and so on. But later when Paul was relating that incident, as mentioned in Acts chapter 22, you'll recall, verses 1 through 16. And you get down to 16, you get to what the preacher told him. Now Jesus said, you go into the city, there it will be told you what you must do. We don't find what he's told he must do in 9, Acts 9, but we do find it in Paul's relating that incident in Acts 22. And uh, what it is, the preacher said, now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, there's no question to you and me, but that Paul was still Saul, that he, as he was then called, was still in his sins. He was a person who wasn't free of sin. He had sinned Jesus. He had uh, been had his sight restored. Uh, he had talked with a preacher. And lo and behold, he was still in sin. Uh, the preacher told him, now, why, what are you waiting for? Why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 
I think that probably there are many passages in the Bible that are their own purpose that might be used by some as a crutch to limp along on a doctrine that isn't in harmony with the will of God. For instance, in John chapter 6 and verse 47, you'll find Jesus saying, He that believeth on me hath eternal life. And you'll find that verse quoted and re-quoted and quoted again by those who believe in faith only as God's plan to save. Many other passages are used uh, to indicate that it's by faith. And no one would gainsay the necessity of faith. You wouldn't speak against that. You wouldn't say, well, faith isn't necessary, for it is the prerequisite, isn't it? Faith is so important that the Hebrew writer points out in Hebrews 11:6 that without faith it's impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In Hebrews 11:1, 1, you'll remember, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And he goes on to list a great number of faithful people who by faith did the things that they did. So faith is so essential, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by reading the Word of God, John 20 and verses 30 and 31. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and believing have life through His name. It's plain enough to those who want what the Lord says, and yet there are enough passages in the Bible that if one wanted to ignore those that are so plain to you and me, that they might say, well, hey, I've got the truth here. And not only that, but now they have many of the versions that help them to that conclusion. Back in 1972 or thereabout, the American Bible Society came out with a little translation done by Dr. Brecher, a Southern Baptist gentleman, uh, and uh, it was sold for 25 cents a copy, postpaid. They sold them by the millions. The last account I had, there were 24 million copies of that uh, New Testament circulated before Romans chapter 1 and verse 17 didn't say, by faith alone from beginning to end. It still says by faith from beginning to end, but by faith alone, those first 24 million or more copies had. Dr. Bratcher was so determined that it was faith only that he put it in his New Testament. And in Romans 10, 10, of course, the passage you remember probably quite well, where with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is unto salvation, was rendered to indicate that uh, with uh, your heart you believe and are justified, with your mouth you confess and are saved. The New International Version follows that same general route. None of them have been quite so bold as to put only after faith in Romans 1.17, though. You'll recall the passage, won't you, where Paul says in 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is the righteousness of God revealed from faith unto faith, even as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's what the the Greek says. That's what the King James says. That's what the American Standard says. And it's the truth of God. But it's been changed to indicate that it's by faith only. I'm reminded of what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and from 1 down through 10, but verse 10 particularly, for those who do not love the truth enough to obey it, enough to accept it, enough to receive it, will be sent a working of error, a delusion, that they might believe the lie they prefer instead of the truth. In other words, they'll believe the lie and be damned in believing that lie. I, I'm, I'm rather certain, my opinion is strong, that uh, there are many passages in the Bible that are left there by the Lord uh, to help uh, weed out, you might say, those who don't really want to do what he says they should do. That in the Old Testament, you may remember, as Moses pointed out in Deuteronomy 18, 13, I believe it is, that he would leave, uh, uh, well, lying spirits, that he would leave some who uh, were deceivers to test you, he says, to prove you, to see whether or not it was so. He later told them that the people that they didn't drive out of the land would be as thorns in their sides to mislead them, and certainly it worked out that very way. 
In so many passages in the New Testament, we find warnings against false prophets. Probably the first you'd remember would be in Matthew 7 and verse 15, where Jesus says, uh, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. You know, we think about sheep as being the people of God. Well, these are disguised like sheep. Uh, they're looking like sheep, but they are sheep. They're there ready to devour the flock. In Romans 16, verses 17 and 18, Paul, after saying now, the churches of Christ salute you, greet one another with a holy kiss, the churches of Christ salute you, he said, mark them that cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine of Christ, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fresh speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. We find uh, warning after warning after warning. For instance, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 beginning, Paul says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. Now there's that the faith again that I've been talking about from time to time. Uh, they'll depart from the faith, from the doctrine, from the Word of God, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Isn't it wonderful to think about that we have the Word of God to guide us and we can be warned against and we can be guarded against that kind of thing? And yet we must be aware that there are so many in the land that will teach false doctrine as though it were true. You remember Paul pointing out in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 11 through 13, 13 through 15 rather, excuse me, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 15, that uh, the devil presents himself as a, an angel of light. He doesn't come as, and, as the old devil. He doesn't come as some picture with a long tail with a spear on the end of it or a fork of some kind with horns on his head with hideous uh, appearance, but he comes as an angel of light. And he says, it isn't any wonder then that his ministers present themselves as ministers of righteousness. There's the danger in the land today. You and I are more aware of that than uh, people are in the denominational world. As a matter of fact, I'm afraid so many are deluded into thinking, well, it, there's just no danger. And when we say something against anyone's religion, regardless of how far off it may be, what it has to do with the Mormon doctrine, uh, Mary Baker Eddy's uh, Christian Scientist movement, or some other that's uh, rather far out. They say, why, you just need to be more tolerant, you know. You need to overlook those things and accept those differences. No, the Bible teaches that we are to examine those things by the word of the Lord. Uh, both uh, John, both Peter and John warn against false teachers in the land. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13, Paul says, Now evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Several things I wanted to mention relative to the translations and the dangers of them. I'm confident that you're warned adequately against that. And yet in our, in our brotherhood, I guess you'd say, we have so many now who are going after the NIV particularly. It's become the one version used by our liberal brethren, if you want to put it that way, that uh, it's so far from the truth in so many different places that uh, anyone should see its danger. And I'm confident that the brethren here, the elders here, are seeing to it that uh, you stay with uh, something that's safe and sound, and it can be followed with confidence. And I like that. I want to mention two or three things. I jotted down one or two, and my time's getting away from me, so let me look at the little note I had lest I forget something. There were a couple of passages I wanted to bring to your attention relative to uh, the doctrinal error uh, in some, for instance, now, in the NIV, in Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, we have the word is near you, it is in your mouth, that is the word of faith we are preaching. The Greek says the word of the faith we are preaching. But the, writer go, the translation goes on to say that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's true that verse 9 is uh, it's difficult, it's worded in a difficult manner. 
It's one that could be misunderstood. Verse 10 follows it, the same, the same sentence. And it goes on to say as in the NIV, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Now, this is what God says, but that's what the NIV says. God says that with your heart you believe unto righteousness, not justification. You believe unto righteousness. With your mouth, with the mouth you confess unto salvation. Unto has become a rather unpopular word with translators nowadays. Maybe it's because it's too explicit. It's too precise. It shows towardness. It shows a direction toward something rather than having arrived at it. We believe unto righteousness, toward righteousness, in the direction of righteousness. We confess toward salvation, unto salvation, in the direction of salvation. The uh, RSV has that same passage like this. The word is near you, on your lips, and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. They also leave out the the. And sadly, most of the versions do leave out the before many, in many passages where it is the faith in the Greek, but it's faith as far as the word is concerned. So be aware of that and be warned against it. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For man believes in his heart and so is justified. And he confesses with his lips and so is saved. Now a lot of people believe that. That's their doctrine. And they use such passages that, as that in John 6 and verse 47. And then the, the perverted versions that uh, go along with it in Romans 1.16, Romans 10.17, uh, or 10.10 10, rather, and many other passages that have to do with the same thing. I jotted down two or three things that might be of interest to you. Let me very quickly read them all. Uh, you know, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets. And I'd like to mention, in addition to the ones that I've mentioned last time, and including them as well, that there are passages where uh, there is, well, abundant error in implication by having left out the before faith. For instance, uh, in Acts chapter 15 and verse 9, that I mentioned the last time I was here, uh, Peter is saying that God purified the souls of the Gentiles through the faith, or by the faith. But all the versions have by faith. Rather interesting to think about, isn't it? By faith. You, you go to that and you say, well, surely if it's by faith, that's what it means. That's all you have to have is by faith. And there's so many passages like that. Let me read them without comment, since our time is getting away so uh, very quickly. Romans chapter 5 and verse 2. We have access to that grace through the faith. Romans 3.30. The Gentiles' hearts purified through the faith. Romans uh, 10 and verse 8, we have again uh, the matter of the faith. It's there before you. It's in your mouth. It's on your lips. The word of the faith, the word of the gospel. In Galatians 3 and 23 through 26, where we have that great passage in 26 and 7, about now you're all the children of God uh, by faith in Jesus Christ is the way it's worded in most of them. In the Greek is, it has, uh, uh, now you're the children of God in Christ Jesus through the faith, through the gospel, through the word, through the doctrine of Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ uh, have put on Christ. We find other passages such as that in Ephesians 2.8. We were talking about in the class this morning. By grace through the faith. Through the gospel, the gospel being God's power to save. So then, now we have salvation by grace through the faith. It is by faith in the sense that you must believe. But it's through the faith, the word of God, that it comes. In Philippians 3, 9, that righteousness which is from God based upon the faith. Interesting to think about how clearly the Lord presents his material. Uh, be aware of false prophets. Beware of false prophets guised as the Holy Bible. We have a lot of those. But be aware of the very marvelous story in the Bible that we're told how to reach heaven. Uh, the Bible is our guide from here to heaven. 
And as we study it and learn of it, as Peter points out in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he says, Now laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby unto salvation. Now that last phrase is not in the King James. It's in most of the Greek texts that have been found later, most of the manuscripts, and I think it should be. For it is that, even though it's not stated in the King James, it wasn't in the manuscripts they used. But uh, that you may grow thereby, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby unto salvation. Let me conclude with Paul's statement to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance with the saints, with the sanctified. It's able to build you up now. It's able to give you that eternal inheritance, the word of His grace, the word of God, the Bible, the doctrine of Christ, in which we are to abide. And if we do, we have both the Father and the Son, Second John 9. You may be here tonight and not a child of God may need to be baptized into Christ. The new birth requires that. You're not saved at the point of faith or at the point of faith and repentance or at the point of faith and repentance and confession, but it's at baptism. One is in Christ. He's baptized into Christ, Romans 6, 3. He puts Christ on at that point, and he's raised from the watery graves of baptism to walk a new life. I know you want that if you're not in Christ. Or if you've wandered by the wayside, surely you want to come back home. If you love the Lord, you're going to obey Him. Regardless of what your need is, you'll do what the Lord would have you do. Do you love Him that much, and do you need to come? And will you then, as we stand together and sing?